In this episode, I'm joined by William Anderson, who is a longtime world language teacher and also an administrator in a district in New York. He's going to help us look at ways to welcome new members into our department, how to support them, how to be that new member, and also how to be a colleague helping to support the goals of the department, particularly when we're welcoming in new members. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome on into the World Language Classroom podcast. So today, what we're going to be talking about is kind of the whole idea of being the newbie in the department. And don't turn the podcast off right now because you're thinking, oh, I'm not a new teacher and I'm not in a leadership position because our plan is for this to be a team effort whenever we have someone new to our department. Whether they're new to teaching or just new to our district, we are going to have a role for everyone. So if you are a teacher starting in a new department, if you're in a leadership position, or if you are a colleague, you are going to find a place to jump into this conversation and get some amazing insights from my guest, William Anderson, who is joining us today. I've known Bill for a long time. So you'll probably refer to, you'll hear me refer to him as Bill. So hello, Bill, Will, William, <laughs> which hey, everyone Joshua. might work. How are you? <laughs> Great. How are you? Thank you so much for inviting me to chat today. Oh, it is an absolute pleasure. I know that you'll have insights that will be incredibly useful for listeners. So I would like to start by hearing your story. Sort of where did you come into this world of language teaching? What does it look like for you? And what are you doing as a member of the language teaching community now? Well, I was always a language nerd. Mm. I became fascinated with communicating um, in other languages when I started studying Spanish in seventh grade and then continued by taking Latin in 12th grade and then adding French in my freshman year of college. Um, my undergraduate degree is in Spanish and political science, um, and I earned that degree at Syracuse University. Um, and as I approached my graduation, I was convinced that I was going to be an interpreter or work for the Foreign Service. But then I suddenly realized, wow, the competition was high with so many polyglots out there who grew up understanding two to three languages and then studying an additional two to three at the university. Um, so I was like, oh, no, will I find a job? I was fortunate enough that the university offered me a fellowship to earn a master's degree in foreign language education. I was thrilled. I mean, who turns down a free master's degree, right? <laughs> One of the responsibilities of the fellowship was to teach Spanish 101 and 102 to undergraduates. I figured I could do that. I love Spanish. <laughs> yeah. The first day I stepped foot in the class, greeted my students, and started sharing my love of Spanish with them, I knew immediately that teaching was my life's purpose. Uh -huh. That's exactly what I wanted to do um, for the rest of my life. It was just mm -hmm. such an amazing experience. I loved every minute of it. And keep in mind, I was probably two to three years, maybe four years older than most of these undergraduate students mm -hmm. at the time. So um, definitely... Um, um, definitely a huge learning curve, but I loved every second of it. And 30 years later, I'm starting my 30th year of teaching this year. Um, wow. and, and that's, that's my story. Wow. So you were, have you been in the classroom for this entire time? So I was a high school Spanish teacher for, uh, 12 years. Um, and then I decided to become an administrator. Hmm. 
and because I just had those as the the you know leadership aspirations, mm -hmm. so I became a um, an administrator, in you know a world language administrator and mm -hmm. um, an ENL English as a new language we call it in New York State or ESL in other states, mm -hmm. um, and that's what I've been doing since two thousand four. Um, I supervise a group of forty teachers in the Massapequa School District mm -hmm. on Long Island in New York. And I love my job. I love every nuanced aspect of, of what I do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I have amazing teachers mm -hmm. that I work with. And that's part of what makes me love my job. I could, I could do this for the next 10, 15 years. Do you still have an opportunity to be in the classroom as a teacher as well sometimes? I do. Well, I always feel going in and doing observations of teachers is, while not teaching, it is kind of an opportunity to be there in the classroom when that teacher is bonding with the students and being mm -hmm. able to experience and observe that. But also, I, I teach at uh, Hofstra University. I teach a, a world language methods course. So I'm oh, teaching okay. university graduates and undergraduates. But I feel that part of my job is teaching teachers and right. training new teachers, and and so that that is definitely a, a, a teaching a daily teaching opportunity for me. Which makes you the ideal person to have this conversation with us about you know working with with new teachers. And so when you say you have forty teachers in your department, how many school buildings does that entail? In the Massapequa School District, we have nine. Building. So we have six elementary mm -hmm. because we do have a Spanish FLESS program and we have a middle school and then we have a ninth grade campus of our high school and then the 10 through 12 main campus of our high school. Mm -hmm. And which languages are offered in your department, in your school district? So we, are, we have a Spanish FLESS program in grades three to five. Mm -hmm. In our middle school, we offer French, German, Mandarin, Chinese and Spanish. Um, and then at the high school level, we have American Sign Language as an elective, which is also a very popular language um, as, a, uh, as an elective program for our students. So can I ask, as an administrator overseeing so many different languages, do you feel it's necessary to be effective to know and be able to speak all of those languages. I'm guessing that doesn't usually happen, but what's your what's your take on that when you're overseeing teachers of languages that might not be your area of proficiency? So I think that rarely happens for world language directors or department heads. I think there is certainly value to knowing more about the language and the culture um, of of the of what the teacher is teaching, uh, I mean, I was a Spanish teacher. I took French, so those classes are very easy when I am observing to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, even in German, I can pick up some cognates here or there, or mm -hmm. um, get a sense of what's going on. Uh, when we brought Mandarin into the district, I asked my superintendent. I said, you know, I don't really know Mandarin. I'd like to know. I'd like to understand it a little bit more. Um, not necessarily to communicate, but to at least have a sense about, you know, the characters and the tones and have a basic understanding and convince mm -hmm. the, convince my district to let me take two courses at the community college in Mandarin for mm -hmm. two semesters, just because I wanted to, you know, again, feel a little bit connection to the teacher and what the teacher is teaching. And, and so, so I, I think there's, there's value. I certain. I mean, I, I'm not in a position to be able to be fluent in all five languages, but mm -hmm. um, I, I make sure that I understand something about each language in the culture. Yeah, I think that would be incredibly rare. <laughs> you know, I think that a, a lot of administrators find themselves in that position where you you can't know all the content area all the way through, particularly when it's multiple languages. But what you, what you're doing is you're supporting your your teachers as language teachers, not necessarily as Mandarin teachers or Spanish teachers. You know, it's more of a holistic look at that. So let's dive in a little bit to your whole process of, you know, you have an opening in your department, you're looking for whichever language, or whichever level, and teachers are starting to apply for these jobs. And 
what are you looking for in in a teacher to come into your school district? Well, I have to start by reminding everyone that we are in a teacher shortage right now, especially mm-hmm. in the area of world languages. So it has been challenging the last five, six, seven, even eight years to really find a pool of world language candidates, not simply those who are certified, but those who are qualified for a position. What I what I look for when hiring is I'm I'm interested in candidates who understand clearly our standards, the world readiness standards. They understand that our goal is to teach through language, not about the language. Uh, those candidates who have a strong proficiency level in the target language, and most importantly, those who love to work with children, because you'd be surprised that how many go into teaching that don't necessarily like working with children. Um, (laughs) But that being said, if the candidate's language proficiency is not native or advanced, um, that's not necessarily a deal breaker for me. Mm -hmm. However, the ability to connect with people absolutely is a deal breaker. I like to say that um, I can help a teacher improve their content knowledge. I can help them learn the language and improve their proficiency. But it's very challenging to teach someone how to have rapport with students. That's much more challenging. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's going to weigh more heavily than than the content knowledge piece and, and when I'm looking at two candidates that might have similar abilities. So if you're having a conversation with two candidates, what does that conversation look like where you can get a sense of how they connect with colleagues or students? I like to ask candidates um, you know, tell me about a teacher who inspired you. Because I think that says a lot about why we become teachers, but also what was it about that teacher that really inspired them or connected with them? And I think in some respect, that will kind of come out in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Or when you ask them about their experiences in their previous positions or in student teaching, if it's if it's a really new teacher, and Just talk about what were some of the connections that they made with students during their experiences. I think um, that will say a lot um, because I'm sure I'm sure they'll have things to share. Hopefully, I I think Mm -hmm. that's one way of doing it uh, without being so blatant um, in in the questioning. Mm -hmm. I think these these are helpful insights. You know, I think a lot of particularly in the world we're in right now with a lot of open positions and looking for teachers that a lot of these interview scenarios will be happening. So it's interesting to hear like, how can you go about this rather than that directed question? It's more about give me a story of an experience and sort of reading through with that. That's much more effective. Yeah. So once you have your, your new teachers into your department, uh, let's kind of think about how how you're going about supporting them. And this would be more from your administrative role. And there are a couple of, I mean, there are lots of different areas where teachers need support, whether they've been teaching a long time or if they're new to your department. And if we could just kind of break them down to like classroom management and then maybe assessments and planning. So if you want to start with classroom management and maybe you have a new teacher in your department, Let's assume they have maybe limited teaching experience. And what do your conversations or suggestions around classroom management look like? Well, I, I feel that classroom management is often the the most common weakness I see mm-hmm. in new teachers. And, you know, weakness might be a harsh word, but um, it is common to see that as a weakness in new teachers because they haven't had that experience. It seems to me that many teacher preparation programs focus more on theory and pedagogy than they do on classroom mm-hmm. management. So this first job that they uh, get, the first position, their first teaching year, um, that's really the best training ground to see what works and what doesn't work mm-hmm. um, in, in each teacher's classroom. I encourage new teachers to visit other teachers in the department who have established effective classroom routines and management systems that maximize instruction and student time on task. I think uh, they actually love to observe experienced teachers Mm -hmm. for support, just to know what's working here. Um, What are some things, and not necessarily just in the world language department, I encourage them to go visit teachers in math and science and and English and social studies, just because, you know, 
um, good practice is good practice regardless of the content area. Right. When I went from uh, teaching high school to middle and elementary school, I cut my teeth on elementary school class management by spending as much time as possible in the music classroom because that gave the most opportunity for things to bang on. And, and I learned yes. so much from oh, yeah. those music teachers. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They, they, they have it down. They have it down. <laughs> <laughs> So if we look at another sort of category here, when it comes to assessment or planning, which one would be better first? Maybe planning first and then assessment? Well, I think planning and assessment are naturally linked. Sometimes teachers need to understand or be reminded if they're, you know, maybe a, a teacher with experience, um, the importance of backward mm. design or, or rather setting the goals and outcomes of what we want our students to be able to do. If teachers start with that mindset, I think the planning and assessment kind of falls mm -hmm. into line much easier. Once the, te once the teachers can determine that, it provides a more clear structure on how to design mm -hmm. daily lesson objectives to reach those right. goals. Um, I encourage new teachers to work closely with the teachers who teach mm -hmm. the same course. Um, I'm fortunate that I work with a department of professionals who collaborate so well mm -hmm. with one another. Um, they open their arms to new teachers, take them in under their wings and say, here, this is um, what we do here. We'll share this, uh, these lesson plans with you. We'll share these activities with you. Feel free to use them. Or they'll ask them, uh, hey, do you have any ideas that you want to share with us as a new teacher? When we onboard a new teacher, the department is actively involved mm -hmm. throughout the process, from participating on the interview committees to supporting the teachers in the early days of learning the ins and outs of the school building, um, and even providing informal mentoring support to the newbies through, mm -hmm. throughout the school year. They meet during um, planning periods to discuss the curriculum, assessment, and strategies. Honestly, the, this department is one of the reasons I love what I do. And as I mentioned before, I can just keep on doing this because I work with amazing colleagues who are professional and caring, and they collaborate so well together. If there are people listening into our, our conversation right now, and they're in a school where that hiring process or committee does not include teachers in the department, do you feel that that's something that they should be advocating for? That there are teachers from the department that are part of that hiring committee? I absolutely advocate for that. I mean, one of the reasons that I do is I want the teachers in the department to, to feel a sense of ownership with the new people we're bringing in to work with them. Um, and if they were part of that process, they're going to be more supportive of that person that we're bringing in. So I felt that they, they needed to be included in that process. I mean, they're, they're, they don't necessarily have the final say with the candidate, but they're involved and they help narrow it down. And you know, we, we just had a process to hire a new teacher. And I know that this new teacher is going to be working close, working closely with two other teachers. So those teachers and I, we were the committee. And I said, it, you know, at the outset, I said, listen, you know, uh, let's go through, we'll do the interviews. I want to, I want to know from you, which two or three mm -hmm. could you work with at the end of the day? I, it doesn't, it's not about who's number one, who's the best. It's like, which ones can you work with? And let's, let's, let's move forward and then talk about their individual um, mm -hmm. uh, pros and cons. And, um, and I think I know that I'm going to have to rely on those two experienced teachers to support the new, new person. So I want them to feel yeah. that their voice and matters. And that it does, in fact, matter. And, and I like that, the pointing out the fact that these are going to be your colleagues. So let's choose the ones that you feel are going to be good colleagues. You know, other people will decide about the pedagogy and you could decide about who you're going to support and, and also have a reciprocal relationship with. You know, it's not just about what you're going to share from this department, but is this someone from whom you can learn as well along the way? Absolutely. And we found that out during the past 18 months that the newbies and their their use of technology was really supportive of 
the, we'll say, more veteran teachers that maybe weren't using mm-hmm. some of the new digital tools and they relied on, mm-hmm. on that mm-hmm. to get through this pandemic. So um, it was, it was, there was a lot of collaboration and it was, yeah. it was really successful. So if we sort of change the, uh, the view of your leadership position just slightly, that part of it is observing classes and giving feedback to some degree. So uh, we're talking about new teachers to the department, so it's sort of feedback early on, but this could go for any time you observe a classroom. What are those things you look for where you say, this is an effective language learning classroom? What are those things that tick the box? When I'm observing a classroom, I am looking for student Mm -hmm. engagement. That can be teacher to student or student to student. As long as there's student engagement going on, that's that's what I really want to see. And along with that, I expect to be immersed in the target language. The priority in our department is 90% plus in the target language, uh, which we know is an, an, an actful mm-hmm. recommended standard. Um, if we don't immerse children in the language, then it will be much more challenging them for, to, for them to acquire the language. I expect to see routines um, in the classroom, circumlocution that supports language acquisition. Um, I also want to see students interested in the lesson. Is it something that's interesting to them? Because we know if it's not interesting, they mm-hmm. don't really care. Uh, a common question that I ask new teachers and even some veteran teachers is, would you want to be a student in your classroom? <laughs> And they really have to pause and think <laughs> about that. Um, and I think that really puts the mirror mm-hmm. up to them and lets them kind of say, oh, what were we doing today? Was, was this, this boring packet of worksheets? Um, or were they having fun and engaging and, and um, you know, learning something that was mm-hmm. culturally relevant? Uh, that's, that's what we want our students. That's, you want your student walking away. I loved Spanish mm-hmm. class today. I can't wait to go to French class tomorrow. That's what we want our students saying. Yeah, even Stephen Krashen, who is the, you know, he shouts from the rooftops about comprehensible input. He always says it needs to be comprehensible and compelling. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yes. and, and if a teacher appears bored with the lesson, you know that the students are. So yeah. that, that's, that's a clear giveaway when I'm observing mm-hmm. class. But, you know, that being said, with everything we've been through this, this past year and a half, I, this year I plan to focus on, I kind of, I, I stole a mantra that I saw somewhere on social media um, that I'm going to share with my colleagues at our opening department meeting. But I want them to focus on relationships before rigor, grace before grades, patience before programs, and love before lessons. I think it is so critical for our students right now, that whole social and emotional literacy piece with what the students have gone through the past year and a half, that I think that at the end of the day is probably maybe even more important than the content that we're teaching this year. Mm -hmm. We really need to be empathy ambassadors for our students Mm -hmm. and, and our and their parents and our colleagues, we need to mm-hmm. kind of show that show that side, that, that human side to everyone. And I think that will go a long way with supporting our students to being mm-hmm. successful. And when we look back at the, the COVID year or years of teaching, and there's a lot of talk of, oh, deficit, and what did students lose or not gain? And when, when that deficit conversation happens, we lose sight of such an opportunity that happened. Like the, that mantra you just said, those essentials. Yeah. If we hadn't had a pandemic, we wouldn't be having that conversation. It has given us the opportunity to refocus on those essentials. Absolutely. And those essentials are really what help us connect with our students and build those mm-hmm. bonds with our students that we know in the long run is going to help them be successful in our class or be more interested in what we're doing in our class um, or want to um, to meet our expectations more fully by knowing that there's that common understanding going on in the yeah. class. Yeah, that empathy piece, so mm-hmm. important. Absolutely. Yeah. So say I'm a, I'm a new teacher to your department and I, I'm new to teaching. I've done maybe even a master's degree in teaching 
and I'm coming in and I don't know what I don't know. Right? No, we don't know what we don't know. We don't. What are those things that I should be asking about or looking for help on that I don't even know I should be asking for? I think that new teachers are not in, not involved with or know about professional language organizations that are so critical to support our teaching efforts. Um, I remember my first year of teaching in 1992, um, and the department chair said immediately, here, take this form, fill this out, you're joining NYSEFELT. Um, I was like, oh, what's this? I had never heard of this. And so I did and said, okay, we're going to the fall conference. We're going to the annual conference um, in October. And could that, you tell us what NYSEFELT is? I'm sorry, yes. NYSEFELT is the New York State Association. Yes. Of I always like to give shout outs, <laughs> you know. It's making sure. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a shout out for John Carlino and his great organization. But I think teachers don't necessarily hear about that until they get into a classroom or get into a school where other colleagues are talking about organizations. Um, I typically purchase a new membership to our state language association as a gift to each new teacher uh, that I pay for out of pocket. I don't expense it through the school, but I want them to know, oh, here's a gift membership. Um, and you know what? You'll have it for a year and and see what you get out of it. But I want them to know what those organizations mm -hmm. um, have. This this helps them learn that there are groups available that will provide professional development opportunities, scholarships, awards, or even mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, the national, regional, and state associations are at the forefront of, of language teacher support. I mean, I know I wouldn't be where I am today without NYSEFELT. Um, AATSP, the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, mm -hmm. NECTFEL, the Northeast Conference on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, and of course, ACTFEL, the American Council mm -hmm. for the Teaching of Foreign Languages. I wouldn't be where I, I am today if it mm -hmm. were not for those organizations. So I think teachers don't know about that. So they need to ask, uh, where can I get support in the district? But where are other ways for me to get support in the community or in the area? And I think mm -hmm. that would be a great question to for new teachers to ask. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. They, they'll get so many ideas and inspiration from that. And I want to pivot right now to ask about where your inspiration comes from. You know, it seems like you spend a lot of your time helping to inspire the teacher in your department. That's what makes you a, an effective administrator. But where does your your inspiration come from? Are there courses and workshops? And you mentioned a couple of organizations, but mention them again if they're in the list. Um, well, I, again, NYSEFELT is where I started um, eons ago. Um, and the support with that organization, with the, the annual conferences and the professional development. Um, I actually received, uh, as, an, as a graduate student, I received a graduate um, scholarship from NYSEFELT. Um, before I even really joined. Um, but there are a lot of places out there. It's just really looking for them. Um, I love reading your World Language Classroom blog that you send out <laughs> once a week. And, you know, I, sh I forward that email to my um, department in Massapequa, but also I uh, periodically forward it to our, um, our graduate students at Hofstra in our program, um, although most of them have already signed up for it, I believe, because that's one of the things that we strongly suggest to them. Oh, um, wow. So I, I am, I'm definitely <laughs> um, uh, calling you out there for that. Um, I think Larry Ferlazzo and Jennifer Gonzalez have wonderful ideas mm -hmm. uh, related to language instruction. Um, Jennifer Gonzalez is called a pedagogy. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, there are just so many people out there sharing what they know and what their experiences are. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of teacher prep programs for world language ed, um, I think are sharing those resources mm -hmm. with their students. I know my colleagues in, in other institutions on Long Island absolutely um, share and encourage their students to sign up for the blogs and, um, and to go to the websites and, and, and take um, uh, their workshops. Um, so lots of great resources out mm -hmm. there. You just have to ask or ask a colleague, okay. hey, do you know one I can sign up for? So I think mm -hmm. that's a great recommendation for newbies. So great. Uh, so now I want to pull the curtain aside a little bit from 
uh, William Anderson, the teacher administrator. And this is the part of the episode which we all look forward to. And it's the get to know you a little better with the this or that questions. And some of these come from Twitter followers. So if you're listening, look out for on Twitter when I ask for some of the this or that questions. You ready to go down this road? I'm ready. Lay it on me. Okay. All right. Ready? Now, some of these, I've known you for a while, so I have an idea, but I'm interested to hear what you're going to say. Ready? Yes. Camping or a hotel? Absolutely hotel. The more stars, the better. <laughs> I, I kind of figured that one. All right. Ready? Uh, and I know because you're a uh, Starbucks fan, as I am, are you a light roast or a dark roast? I am dark roast, French roast. The darker the roast, the better. I know that it has less caffeine, um, as my partner tells me all the time. Um, but I just love the taste. That French roast from Starbucks, I just love that flavor. It's so great. It's your happy place. I'm addicted. Huh? I'm, I'm I'm an addict. Absolutely. Yes, it is. It's your and office. It's my happy place. It, it <laughs> is. It's my headquarters. Headquarters. It that's it. Headquarters. headquarters. Yes. Yes. Right. And the last one here for a little insight, the scenic route or the highway? That's so interesting because we just took a road trip and we took the highway going. Uh, we thought about taking the scenic route coming back, but... On the way back, it's like, I just want to get home. <laughs> so it was it was the highway, I have to say. But I'm not opposed to scenic. So I guess I'm right down the middle there. All right. So good to learn those little <laughs> tidbits of ours. We, we identify so much as teacher in our lives. That it's, it's good to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit, get to know about you. So as we finish up here, do you have any words of advice for those new teachers or those administrators, those colleagues about this whole new to the department concept? Absolutely. Um, uh, I have two things to share. And mm -hmm. I have to say, the two things I'm going to share, I borrow from a very good friend of mine, uh, Lori Langer de Ramirez, um, who is um, known for her Mis Cositas website, which is another one I should have mentioned earlier. But Lori and I are friends from way back. And um, two things that she mentioned to me over the years that stick with me and I think are so important um, to share with anyone, but certainly with new teachers, um, are these two quotes. Sharing is caring. So don't feel that you're stealing something from someone else. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, because sharing is caring. We want to share with each other what good practices are or where the great restaurant is um, or where the best French roast coffee is to buy. So uh, sharing with each other is, is really caring for one another. Um, and her other quote is seek joy, mm -hmm. which I think is what we all need to do. Need, seek joy and that will get you through um, carry a language teacher through even the most harrowing days in the classroom. Mm -hmm. All right. So if teachers want to connect with you, teachers that are listening, whether they're administrators or new teachers, is there somewhere where they can connect with you? Absolutely. Um, my Twitter handle, which is really our department Twitter handle, is at Pequa, P-E-Q-U-A, World Lang, L-A-N-G. Um, and, or you can email me at wanderson at msd.k12.ny.us. I'm always encouraging people to email if they have questions or, um, or want to just share a funny story. Oh, excellent. I really appreciate your generosity of everything you've shared for taking the time to be with us today. I know it has been very useful for everyone listening. So thank you so much for your time and your insights. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate it. I'll come back anytime. We got some really actionable tips from that conversation with William Anderson. I always appreciate that reminder about how important the relationships are that we have with our students and to make the input compelling and not just comprehensible. Be sure to check out the show notes so that you can connect with William Anderson. And you can also see a link on there for Talking Points, which is my weekly newsletter where you will get tips and tools during the week and you will know when the new podcast episodes come out and what they are all about. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. 
Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.